we're lucky today to be joined um, by uh, Dr. Yamini Dalal. Uh, Dr. Dalal graduated with a double major in biochemistry and life science from St. Xavier College. She's got her PhD from Purdue and postdoc at Fred Hutchinson in uh, Seattle and uh, currently at NIH in Bethesda and uh, studying mm -hmm. the role of epigenetics in cancer. And uh, I think that's pretty interesting. And uh, so let's let's start. We at think the so beginning. too. <laughs> <laughs> how uh, sure. how'd you get in? How'd you get interested in this? How how did it all begin for you? Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a good question. Uh, so my my original interest was in chromosome structure, and uh, this is basically trying to understand how the human genome is packaged up and regulated in normal cells. And this is what I did for uh, almost 10 years. About five years ago, uh, as, as many people have somebody in their family uh, who, who has cancer and that sort of wakes them up, I had the same experience. Uh, and uh, about the same time that my grandmother had liver cancer, two of my closest friends at the Hutch, uh, women my age, both scientists, both excellent scientists, had two different types of cancers. And that really sort of woke me up to the possibility that uh, there was a whole new unexplored area of epigenetic research uh, that could be done in tumor cells. Mm -hmm. This is when I was still a postdoc, and um, obviously the project I was working on at the time was trying to understand normal centrum and normal chromosome function. And what I decided I would do is once I finished that, I would apply to get my own lab, which, which is what you do after you finish your training. And in my lab, we would exclusively then look at epigenetic, epigenetics and epigenetic mechanisms in tumor cells, and that's what we've been doing for the past two and a half years. And so that's really how I got interested in it. it was a personal event, I think, uh, as it is for most people. Yeah, I think I think probably everyone's been touched by cancer, right, at, at one point or another. And that's right. That's right. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's pretty cool. So, so what do you? How do you define? How do you define cancer? I mean. Yeah, that's a that's a tricky question. Um, so, so, so if you take just the clinical definition, right, uh, what a doctor would look for in a biopsy is uncontrolled cell growth, and they look for specific, specific modifications and changes to cells. And often these changes are on the cell surface or in the way the cell divides or in particular markers. Uh, my definition is obviously going to be influenced by what I study. And here we're looking specifically for chromosome instability. And this is where in, in tumors that have advanced, you see a lot of chromosome breakage, and the chromosomes break and they fuse to another chromosome, and this is called the chromosome break uh, fusion bridge cycle. And what this allows the tumor to do is take advantage of genes that maybe got turned off because of the fusion events, or new genes that were created that never existed, fusion genes, uh, or alternatively, yeah, genes that get hyperactivated because they're part of this fusion. And so this, what was cool about this uh, from the point of view of mechanism is that all of the stuff in the, in the genome is occurring in the context of the, the way the DNA is packaged into this substance, substance called chromatin. And so if you want to understand how chromatin breaks or how chromatin fuses, you have to understand the, the molecules that make up uh, the packaging. And that's sort of what we study. And so from my point of view, what we're interested in looking at is why chromosome, in, chromosome instability occurs in the first place, what's driving it, and uh, try to understand uh, why, why it occurs in a certain class of tumors or a certain progression of tumors, but not maybe right away, not in the first hit or the second hit. And that's sort of what we've been focusing on these past couple of years. Okay, so I guess, is it possible that maybe what we call cancer is a number of very different things, maybe different diseases? Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not enough of, of an any... expert to say, uh, yeah, so I, I, think, I think it's clear that cancers can be caused by different things. So nobody, I think, would argue that right. every single cancer starts off the same way. But what's inevitable is that right. once it gets to the point where it's a, it's a solid tumor or it's metas you know, met metastasis is occurring, uh, all tumors have to undergo this process of transformation where they be become, you know, go from benign to becoming malignant. And that process is probably conserved, is my guess, because all of these cells behave the same way. They have unlimited growth potential. They're scavenging, you know, 
uh, resources from the host, if you will, and chromosomally they look really bad. They've gotten all these breaks and the chromosomes don't look normal anymore. So once you've gotten to that point, I think most of the tumors maybe behave similarly, but that doesn't mean the treatments will be the same. Sorry to diverge from uh, what we, the script, but uh, are a lot of people studying um, chromosomal abnormalities in their relation to cancer that you know of? I mean, is this, uh, do you have a lot yeah, of, I don't that, know, that's a good question. Or... So it turns out, when I started thinking about doing these experiments that we're doing now, nobody's doing, it, doing them the way we're doing them. So we're looking literally at the single molecule level. We're looking at single chromosomes and at the substructure to figure out why, they, why things break. Uh, most people have been looking at this from the point of view of cytogenetics, which is where you look at the whole chromosome from a patient or the whole chromosome spread by light microscopy. The tools we use are far mm -hmm. more sophisticated in terms of being able to look at things at a much, much higher resolution. So we're taking all that knowledge um, that the cytogeneticists have accumulated uh, and then using that in our experiments to go further. And I think we're fairly unique in doing that because the combination of tools that we use is really quite uh, I wouldn't necessarily, necessarily say cutting edge. The tools have been around for a long time in physics, for example. Uh, it just so turns out we've got the right uh, culmination of all these tools coming into the lab at the same time, so we can actually do it all at the same time. And maybe and, that's our and you're using We're able to look at things differently. And, you, and you're using uh, yeah. mass So we're using... Spectra. Yeah, so we're using three or four different... Uh, we're actually using a lot of techniques, so I'll just, I'll just touch on the main ones. And I'll tell you what they do. So we use atomic force microscopy, which is a physics tool. It's been around for a long time. And what it allows you to do is basically look at things at very, very high resolution, at single molecule resolution, from native chromatin, uh, native chromosomes from tumor cells. You can actually look at that one molecule at a time. So that allows us to actually see the changes wrought by the cancer cell. Uh, we're using mass spec, which is a method to look at uh, the way chemical modifications on the proteins change in the tumor cell. And we've got a very nice story where we'll be able to show that that's happened. Uh, so that's, again, a very high resolution method. It requires, it's very tedious because you have to purify you know, an enormous amount of protein to be able to do those experiments. But that's where it benefits us because the tumors, of course, grow like wild. So we can get a lot of sample. Uh, the other methods we use are genome-wide profiling. And this is where you basically want to know it's as if you were standing in a room and you had the same protein, multiple copies of that same protein, and you want to know the exact address of all those proteins in that room. And so the room is the genome, and this particular protein normally is only present at the center of the chromosome, at the X, and it turns out in tumors, it takes over a large part of the chromosome. And so we were interested in knowing how it does that. And in order to know that, we had to first say, well, where does it go? And so that's a tool that's very popular now. It's called genome-wide uh, profiling, and we use that as well. Uh, in addition to that, we use, you know, sort of classical molecular biology and biochemistry techniques that probably other labs use as well. But these three techniques combined allow us to have insights that probably other labs wouldn't be able to, would, wouldn't be able to easily have. Yeah, that's, that's pretty interesting. Um, I'm, I'm impressed. Um, so, are you familiar with, cool. uh, yeah, um, are you familiar with NCI's uh, new initiative to sort of encourage more uh, inter-multidisciplinary yeah. um, work in, in science? And I guess, you know, what do you think about that? Yeah. And how, how important is it that, you know, people from diverse fields sort of work together? I think it's incredibly important. Because I think it's clear that biology by itself is not sufficient. I think it's very clear. If you look at cancer uh, in a sort of holistic sense, there's many, many things going on, right? So there's feedback from the environment. The cancer takes up certain nutrients that maybe normal cells don't. The microenvironment around the tumor is going to be different compared to, let's say, a normal liver or a normal kidney. Uh, so getting people who understand all these different processes and putting them in the same room, I think, is crucial. And I think it's too bad it hasn't been done before, but I think it's great the NCI is doing it right now. Uh, so I, I think it's a great idea, because in my own lab, we use tools that traditionally are not considered biological tools. Atomic force microscopy was used by you know, chemists and physicists to look at silicon chips, for example. And we're using it to look at tumor samples. I mean, this is you know, fairly revolutionary. 